there we go. Okay, good. Shut up. Oh gosh. Uh, yeah. So um. Bueno. <laughs> yes, God. <laughs> He's calling your name. All right. So guys, welcome to the kingdom. My name is Carlos. Um. Yeah. So um, I have a sermon uh that I prepared for that I think would be amazing, but. Um, I kind of feel just so kind of flow with it, you know? Somebody say flow with it. You know, and um, oh man, you know, uh, the enormity of what Jesus has done on the cross scares me at times. Is anybody in that situation? Like you read some verses and like, dang, it's too good to be true. You know, and I have one core value in my life when I invite people to speak or when I'm in the room trying to entertain like a theological conversation or grow an understanding of God, it's one thing. It's like, just don't make him smaller you know and, the, and it's important because when you look at the cross the cross is the revelation of god's heart how many know that the cross isn't a picture of what god's willing to inflict but it's a picture of what god's willing to endure in order to see you set free from the thing he paid to set you free from which is sin and death yeah. you know in the gospels it's good news man but it's not good news for people who are banking on morality it's not good for people who are, through their own effort, through their own good works, trying to obtain what Jesus did. You see, there's this ugly thing that's crept into the church. I mean, it's always been in the church. It's from the fall of man. It's called dead religion. Somebody say dead religion. Yeah. And um, dead religion is this. This is the working definition I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the one he talks about in James and Peter, the, um, the good religion. This is the, the, dead, the dead one. And it says this right here. So dead religion is this. This is what I'm talking about. It's man's attempt to establish a right relationship with God outside of Jesus. It's man's attempt to do what only Jesus could do. And the thing is, on the journey of religion, there's things you can do outside the nature of God that make you feel like it's right. But at the end of the day, it's just bankrupt. You know, and Jesus comes to earth and he has a big message about grace and it's, it's what kind of people that want to crucify him? It's the religious. It's the people who have on their own account, their own merit, their own workings for righteousness that can't just say, all right, Jesus, I trust you. It's your righteousness that I need. So they end up crucifying him because they want religion. And there's a couple of things I want to talk about. And I was going to talk about being born again today and it's a very hot topic and how many and if you're anything like me i grew up in a church where um when i was little i was baptized in the catholic church and um i was baptized so i was saved in the catholic church and then um i was a practicing catholic for the most part of my life at the age of 20 or 21 or 23 i went to a non-denominational church they said no no no, that, 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 that doesn't work that baptism is not real you gotta ask jesus into your heart because if you confess with your mouth brother and believe in your heart then you'll be saved you know romans 10 9 so i did that I did that, right? Boom, boom. I did that, and then I took another dive, a dunk. Boom. And now it's not a denominational one, so now I'm saved in their eyes, and I'm saved in my eyes. And then as you keep growing and you catch yourself in this journey, uh, I went to I went to another church, and I saw them heal the sick. And it was a small meeting of 30 people, and it blew my mind. I'm like, why are these guys actually doing the things Jesus did? I'm in this big non-denominational church not doing anything. And we love Jesus. We're all sincere. We all love him. You know, and then I went there. And they told me that, well, you got to speak in tongues if you want to get born again. And there was always this removing requirement to get born again, right? And, and born again, as we know it, if you say the prayer, if you do a confession of faith, the sinner's prayer, are you baptized, are you dunked, are you sprinkled? Like all these different things are criteria that build different divisions and denomination to simply say, are you in or out? And my journey has been that up until I really met Jesus. And I thought that, okay, once I went from one denomination to another denomination, that I was just incrementally getting all the pieces I needed for this thing called salvation. And every denomination had a different demand. So I had to speak in tongues. And then, man, now you're really born again, you know? And that bullseye just keeps moving the rest of your life, and there's no rest there. You ever been there? You know, some people show up to church because they're not sure if they're born again. They're not sure if their conversion or their sincerity and confession was enough. So if I show up more, guess what? It become more real. And all that sounds good. And that sounds like the Pharisees. And you see in, in some of the most amazing conversations Jesus has in Scripture, he's not um, raising the bar for salvation. He's actually eliminating it. 
and it's dangerous and it's scary. And some people say, you can't say that, Carlos, because um, if you just say everybody's forgiven because of what Jesus did without their decision, without their agreement, without their faith, well, they're just going to go and live recklessly because they are. You ever heard that? The thing is, they're ready to do that without permission. And what you come to see is that in this conversation, the whole scorekeeping conversation, that Jesus comes to annihilate and show you only it's by his work that you can be saved or born again or sanctified. It's a people that still are coming based on their morality, their performance, their decision, their faith that are struggling with this. They have a hard time understanding why Jesus would be with sinners and not the temple trying to match up to what they're trying to match up. And religion's nasty. It's kind of like a, you buy a bed and you're enamored by the bed. And it's a king size bed that you've always wanted. Now you can afford it. And you lay down and it's great for like three or four months. And you're like, man, uh, the bed is still comfortable. But man, if I just upgraded and I bought new sheets, it would feel a lot better. And then you buy new sheets and what happens? It feels a lot better. And then you get used to that. And then, oh man, I just probably need more pillows. So you get new pillows. You spend a lot of money on this, right? And you go to the big place and you show your friends look how much I paid for X, Y, Z. And you spend 30, 40 years of your life sincerely wanting to sleep well and continue to upgrade and upgrade. Why? Because religion likes return customers. And what you find out when you meet Jesus is that you're in the wrong bed to begin with, no matter how comfortable and how many upgrades it is, because it's only his bed that produces life. See, religion demands, grace provides. The good news of the gospel is that the gospel doesn't demand repentance. The good news is that when you hear it, it produces repentance. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God, the story of Jesus. So it doesn't demand my faith. When I hear the story of Jesus, when I was still yet a sinner, without my permission, without my decision, that he died for me. And that is objectively true. And people think, don't tell people that. They're going to become apathetic in their faith if they're just justified by the faith of Christ. Or they're not going to want to have faith. Why would they? But the thing is, you see, every author in Scripture that makes these crazy claims, like Paul says, as one died, how many died? The church? No, all died. And it says if you were co-crucified with him, talking about everybody, because everybody died, surely you were buried and risen. And it doesn't come to the conclusion that it requires your decision for that to happen. But nearly Paul, he says that, and then he says something crazy in Romans 5 that I'm still kind of wrapping my head around. He says something like this. All were made sinners in Adam. How many? All. All. And then in some translations, it says, but many will be made righteous by Christ. But the same word, all in the Greek. And what we have is a vitamin A deficiency. All. We can't face the fact that all means all. But if you tell people all, they're not going to do anything with it. John makes two, he makes one inclusive, one exclusive statement. The inclusive statement is this. The exclusive statement is this, that there's no way to the Father except for me, he says, Jesus says. And that sounds pretty exclusive. Like there's no way to the Father except for Jesus. Is that right? Absolutely. But then he makes a very inclusive statement. He says, in that day, when I'm on the cross, you will know that I am in the Father, he is in me, and you are, and we are one. You're going to awaken to the fact that this is real. It doesn't become real when you add faith. It doesn't even become real on your sincerity. It became real because when you had no faith, Jesus had it for you. And all these authors who are making this inclusive statement that all are in, all are sanctified. All are justified. All are made righteous. As one man's act of disobedience, all were made sinners. Everybody's into that universal condemnation, right? That everybody was condemned by one man, Adam. But in the same way as one man's act of righteousness, Jesus, all will be made righteous. So yes, that's true, and this is true. But you, you can't tell people that because they're going to go live like hell knowing that they're righteous without their work. I'm like, no, baby. When you understand the work it takes to make you righteous, when you were still yet a sinner, doesn't put that in your heart to want to live in sin anymore. 
literally every author that uses this scary language is also seems to be the biggest evangelist. And Bill is up here talking about universal. Does this confuse anybody when he's talking about universal atonement versus universal reconciliation versus universal salvation? And what is it? If Christ did everything, why do I have to do anything? And he says, well, Carlos, if everybody's saved, if everybody's justified, if everybody's already set free, not by our will, but by Jesus' will, well, then why would they do anything? I'm like, why is that a question? The people who wrote this thing were the biggest evangelists getting persecuted because they believe something so beautiful about them without their contribution. So the gospel doesn't demand your faith. It doesn't require your faith. When you hear about it, when you were still yet a sinner, it produces faith. That's how good this is, and it's scary. Because it removes any ability for you to try to earn this. You're saved by grace through faith. Not that you can boast. When you say, I had enough faith to be saved, well, one, I got to ask you, well, how much faith was that? Because I want to make sure I'm in two. But nobody could ever answer that. Is it the top 10% of faith of all humanity that gets in? Is it this denomination's faith that gets in? Is it that? And there's no answer to that. It's a revolving door. And it keeps you in that same bed apart from Christ. Dead religion is man's attempt to set himself right outside of what Jesus has already done. Take it back to the garden. There we had a right relationship with God. They were created in his image. They were enjoying fellowship, right? And they did the unthinkable. The devil said, hey, if you want to be like God, just do this. And this is where religion shows up. Do it's something you can do on your own, outside God's source, outside of his image, to become like him. And guess what they already were? So the profession of Christ because of his death and resurrection, while you were still yet a sinner, has made you holy, blameless, and above reproach. And anything you try to do to add to that is a false gospel. You could be the biggest intercessor. You can have the biggest prayer language. You can be contending for the faith. But if you don't understand that you've been contended for it without your agreement, they're dead works. You see, the good news of the gospel is this. Jesus just hasn't forgiven you of your dead works for righteousness. So think that didn't work. You know that time when you prayed and fasted for 24 days straight and nothing happened, you just got more hungry and went to KFC and no breakthrough? That was a dead work for righteousness. But at the time you did fast and you got revelation and you just hit and you felt you were growing more in the spirit and becoming more Christ-like and it was landing. He's forgiven you that too. Because no works of righteousness, whether they're good or bad, can save you. Only his work for righteousness can. Shows up on the scene to religious people, and the first thing he says is, seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness and your effort and your structure and your paradigms to, to make you this real, to get God pleased. I'm sorry, it can't work. That's why I got to come for you, do it as you, live your life, die your death, raise you with me, because you can't do it any other way. I don't know where I'm going with this, but this is important. <laughs> And the guy has, he's, he's paralyzed. And what's the first thing Jesus says? Your sins are forgiven. He didn't ask. He wasn't interested in joining church. He wasn't even interested in being saved. He can't walk. It makes it good news. And when you see that he's choosing to embrace you and forgive you and show who you are in spite of your mess, you don't want to live in that mess anymore. But we've made it so transactional. That if you do this, you get this. That's an Old Testament paradigm. If you do good, you get good. If you do bad, you're cursed in the Old Testament. But how many know that there's a new covenant? And there's a new high priest and a new sacrifice and a new commandment? Yeah, the old commandment used to be love God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. But then guess what? The new high priest from Melchizedek comes. Jesus Christ himself and says, I'm the new high priest. I got a new covenant. And guess what? Because I'm the new high priest, I have a new command. Yeah, you heard it through Moses. You heard it through Elijah. That you should love your neighbor with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. And that is the greatest commandment in the law. But if you're in Christ, you are set free from the demands of the law. I gave you the law to show you that you can't do it. Just give up and just say, I can love myself, my wife, my brother with commands. Love others. 
That's the same thing, Jesus. That's the same demand. Oh, I forgot something. As I have loved you. My God. I'm not saying you shouldn't try to love your family and your sister and your brother and all this family and God that heart, my body, soul, and strength. I'm just saying in the new covenant, you don't have to be commanded to. Because his love precedes you and it wraps around you when you're still yet a sinner, trying your hardest and still falling short and living under that treadmill of trying and never enough. All that stuff. He comes and saves you from that wrecked system, puts his own system inside of you where his love for you provides love for others. And now you don't have to be commanded to love God anymore. Because his love for you is overfilling and the enjoyment of your natural design, your at homeness wants to love back without him having to command you to. That's my life message right there. That's what saved me. I spent seven years in church sincerely trying to love God with a heart, body, body, soul, and strength. And I was in more sin, more delusion, more guilt, more shame, more condemnation. And people cheered me on. We'll just try harder, brother. You must be not be fasting enough. You must do this enough. You must not be taking communion. And you're probably not serving. And you probably need to search your heart, brother, and see if there's hidden sin in there, brother. And you maybe need to go to this therapist or that therapist. You know, we'll pray for you and all these different things. And they were very sincere. You can do it. You can fulfill the law. You can love God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. And even though we're failing to do it too, we're the Pharisees in the room inviting you into that conversation. <laughs> And I said, lost it. I said, I can't do this. This is impossible. I can't love God with my heart, my body, and soul, and strength. I found myself like uh, Paul in Romans 7. Dude, I did the law more than anybody. I fed the poor. I preached. I led worship. I was there three hours to serve. I was feeding the poor. I was running a restaurant. I was giving food free to serve God and do all these different things. And when my head hit the pillow, I didn't do enough. <laughs> and then you're telling me that I got to do more? I am out. And I got ridiculed. And they called me a backslider. <laughs> backslider. Walked away. And somebody who's actually read the Bible in context, <laughs> who didn't go to Bible school, said, you know, Carlos, yeah, I mean, just open this up. That's what it's like to live under the law. It's, you're having the Paul Roman 7 experience. Well, why do I do the things I don't want to do? The things I don't want to do, I do them anyway. Like, who can ever deliver me? But I love you, Jesus. And this whole conversation of combination and sizing myself up apart from him was happening every day in my life. And the more I tried, the more it condemned me. And then he says, oh, but I've been set free from the spirit of law and death because of the spirit of life. And someone says, Carlos, you can never fulfill that unless God loves you first. So what I'm trying to tell you today, church, is you don't have to be God pleasers anymore. He's pleased as punch with you through the blood of Jesus Christ. And it wasn't your commitment. It wasn't your devotion. It wasn't your prayer language that made that happen. But rather, when you understand that your prayer language, your devotion, your discipline is something that doesn't weigh you down, but it actually ushers you into the presence that's already inside of you. Is that okay? I want to go through a couple of stories because um, we have a friend with us. His name is Emanuelo. And you guys know Emanuel, right? If you don't know, it's uh, it's our friend Emanuel, and um, he no look too good. Oh, man, I should really save this for next time. But I'm going to go through a bunch of stories because I want you to locate today when you walk out of this room what you're trying to do for God or is it what God has done for you? The first person is the, the rich young ruler. And the rich young ruler has it all together. He's a man of the law, man. He, he, he loves God. It's a, he's a godly man, he even says. And he shows up to the scene. And he asks Jesus this one question. He says, Jesus, what must I do, do to have eternal life? What must I do in my own works to have what you have, Jesus? And Jesus doesn't shut him down. He's like, okay, well, if it's going to be about what you can do, well, then you better fulfill all the law. Because remember, James 2.10 says, man, if you're, if you're an errant one, you miss it all. You wreck the whole thing. If you have a little chip in the glass, it's all broken. And the guy even has the audacity to say, well, I've done that. I kept the law. These guys, okay, well, the law is not meant to save you anyway. So even if you could, it wouldn't save you. 
because the law is never meant for righteousness. It was meant to keep you in line so you don't eat each other and so I can reveal myself to you in love. Anyways, so this guy there is sad, and Jesus goes, you know, just go sell all your goods, give it to the poor, and then follow me, and the guy can't do that. He has a bigger God than him. He loves his riches. And the disciples are around. And they see this really rich guy with a lot of favor, a lot of clout, big websites, big ministry, big pockets, who can really fund Jesus' ministry. This guy could put Jesus everywhere, YouTube, everywhere. Private jets, Benny Hinn style. <laughs> and the guy walks away and he says that Jesus was sad for him. The broke fisherman who is barely making ends meet is following Jesus. And they're like, man, this guy has... He's more righteous than we are. He's obtained the law. Man, did you hear all the laws he did and all the commandments he kept and how rich he is? Well, if he can't make it, well, then how are we going to make it, Jesus? And Jesus doesn't go, oh, well, just go try harder than him. Or go start another business and make more money than him so we can grow this thing. He says one thing. He says, you know, what he's looking for, everlasting life that he sees in my life, is not possible with man. But it's possible with God. There's another story in the Bible that's very similar. This is talking to these Pharisees, and they're um, they're kind of getting on his nerves. And that's where Jesus says, "You know, um, did I not come to you? And did I not prophesy in your name, heal the sick, cast out demons?" And Jesus says, "Yeah, but you're going to come to me and say, Lord, Lord, I did all. I did all these things. I did all these things. What must I do? And does it is my scorecard good enough to get in? Did I do these things?" And then Jesus would look at him and say, "I'm sorry, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity." The word iniquity means of worthless works. I'm not trying to tell you, don't heal the sick, don't raise the dead, don't cast out demons. Jesus did that. But what I am trying to tell you is don't approach God based on your report card, trying to earn something that is given freely by grace. He shuts them down. And then this man in Nicodemus, you ever heard of him? Have you ever watched The Chosen? Season one, I think it's Number three, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. Blow your mind. Well, Nicodemus is kind of exhausted with his religion, but he's the top of the game. And if I can just give you some context for Nicodemus, it says that he comes to Jesus at night. And when I was in Bethel School Supernatural Ministry to, uh, year number two, we, were, um, we, were, we got to preach in our classes, and the, the one who won the preaching contest would get to preach at school. So guess who won? <laughs> but it wasn't graceful. <laughs> no, it was challenging. It was challenging. And I'll tell you why. Because um, they, gave, they only gave you one verse and said, go at it, kind of. And I'm like, okay, cool. And guess what verse I got? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believeth would not perish but have everlasting life. And I'm like, dude, like, where do you even start? And I have six minutes. So I'm stressed out, I'm anxious, and I have mounds of notes, mounds of commentary. I'm just like studying, and I know this thing lights out. And then I'm unsettled, and I'm about to preach, and I love preaching. And I'm going to, I don't know what I'm going to do. My notes are everywhere. And I go to sleep that night, and I get a dream. And the dream is of Nicodemus. And it's funny because it looks like this picture. And the chosen portrayed it just like I had a dream. And I can imagine this guy named Nicodemus who's been under the law. He's the ruler of the Pharisees. A legit guy. He loves people. He's under the law. He's burdened by the law in his own heart but looks good on the outside. And he's commanding people, condemning people, saying, hey, you haven't done it. You haven't done it. But deep down, he knows something's missing. And then he hears about this guy named Jesus on the scene. And he's walking around healing the sick. He's healing people on the Sabbath. Are you kidding me, Jesus? And it seems like he's breaking the law. And he says things like, well, is the Sabbath made for man or is man made for the Sabbath? And he says these things that kind of really get these guys' minds going. But it says that this guy who's the biggest Pharisee, who knows the law, who's at the top of the building his bed game, 
but he still doesn't sleep well at night. That he wakes up, he's there laying in the bed with his wife in the middle of the night, and his eyes are open, staring at the ceiling. And he knows that there's this guy in town who's walking around, preaching against everything he's done, making it easier. And he's talking with sinners. He should be talking to the most elite law doers, but he's there talking to the people who actually need doctors, right? Who don't, don't have it all together. And he can't sleep at night, so he pounds the bed and he gets up, he puts on his sandals, and he walks across town into the poorest district of Jerusalem, and he knocks on Jesus' door at night. That he knows there's something bigger in the heart of Jesus, in the lens of Jesus, that he has to answer. How can I be saved? You come from God. You do miracles. You are of him. Am I in? I got to know I can't sleep because my life's a lot different from you and I have it all together. It seems like you're in and I'm not. He knocks on the door. Doesn't want to be seen by anybody. Could have. Got to go talk to Jesus. Spill the beans, Jesus. What is it like? And Jesus says, well, in order to see the kingdom, <laughs> to see, ye must be born again. It's in a lot of translations. You must be born again. And he's like, okay, good. Another thing to do. How do I do that? So I have to go into my mother's womb. How do I do that? How does anybody do that, Jesus? I've done everything. I'm lacking one thing. Go get born again, Jesus tells him. Okay, how, he asks, because he thinks it's by work. So Jesus says, I don't know. How do you think how? He's like, well, it's impossible. I can't go into my mother's womb and come back out. And Jesus goes, exactly. It's impossible for you to get born again. And not only when you see the word born again, again is added. It's born of above. So Jesus is saying, don't go do something to try to get born again. He's saying, unless you're born of above, you won't even be able to see the kingdom. So I got to go back to my mother's womb and play this thing out and come back born again. How does that happen? Jesus, he goes, exactly. How many people in this room are born by their own will? How many of you guys asked to be born? How many of you guys' decision motivated your parents to give birth to you? How much faith did it require for Adam to come alive when he was gifted the breath of life? See, we made it a requirement. you got to get born again. And Scripture doesn't say, in the word of Scripture, it doesn't mean you have to do something to get born again. But there's something you can do from the, go to the out column to the in column. He's saying, unless you're born again, unless I do something, you won't even be able to see the kingdom. And then, look at this. In John chapter 1, I hope I have that verse. I don't. Oh, man. John chapter 1, verse 3 says that no man is born by his own will, but flesh, by his own decision, but by the will of God. So Nicodemus has everything, all his ducks lined up, but one duck's out of line and it's killing him. He's that A-type personality. What one thing must I do? And Jesus goes, it's impossible to get born again based on your choice. But because the Bible translation, ye must be born again, we think that people are out. We're trying to get them in. And Jesus says, there's nothing you can do to get anybody else in, nor yourself. He must be born from above. So it's by somebody else's decision that you're born. And just like you didn't come in this world the first time, by your own merit, by your own decision, by your own faith, it's got to be the faith of somebody else. So when you're saved by grace through faith, it's not your faith that gets you saved. It's the faith of Christ when you had none. That's why it's a gift. Are you following me? It scares people because I'm not taking away your expression of how you got born again, whether you said a prayer. Those are, those are all beautiful. But I'm saying it's by God's will that you are born. Not of man. Because what I see in the church is that most people who said, I did this to get born again, well, they got to live under the scope of performance in order to maintain it. And we just sang that song that there's no fear in love, right? But you know that's not most people's re reality? There's no fear in love. But guess what? Without love, there's nothing but fear. When it's on your performance, you have a lot to fear when you stand before God. Because you have everything you've done, everything you haven't done. You come based on your own report card, and God did everything in Jesus to eliminate that belief system in your life so you can approach him with boldness. 
when you see that, you know there's love and there's no fear before him anymore. There's nothing but intimacy. But without this message and putting another condition on how to try to do this, because it's this denomination, and it doesn't say you must be born again. It says unless you're born from above. That word again is not even in scripture. Look at it in the Greek. It says unless you're born of above. So Jesus is saying you got to get born from above. And he goes, well, how do I do that? He goes, exactly. No one's ever ascended or descended like the way I'm going to do. And God wants to unveil this in your heart so much to take the responsibility off of you trying to carry that. So much that now, for God so loved the world, he sent Jesus, what? To die, be buried, risen for you, and as you, so he can see you in heavenly places without your decision. See, your faith does not make that real. Your faith allows you to participate in what's already real, and that's where salvation actually benefits you. All this happened 2,000 years ago. You guys are right? You guys lost? I am. <laughs> but then there's people that say, no, brother, but you got to receive it. And I guess you do have to receive it. And it says right here, like in uh, John chapter 1, they'll say this. This is actually what I was getting to. He was in the world, and the world was made through God. Remember, the world was made by God through him, and nothing consists without him. And the world did not know him, so he came. Jesus had the exact design of what humanity and God was like, and he came to his own expression of that that had been blinded from the fall of man, and they wanted the blind vision. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, the word is lambano, and it's not a transactional receiving. The word lambano means to awaken to. It's a passive receiving. We think that you got to receive it transactionally, put it in your pocket so you can be in. But it's saying that he came to his own, and those who receive the good news, that you can't get in based on your merit, only what I can do for and as you, as the vicarious human and the vicarious God living in the incarnation, can you receive life. To them, he gave them the right to become children of God. Now you can say you actually know God because you know what I've done. And those who believe in his name, who were born, not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Before we even get to John 3, 16, and tell Nicodemus how to be born again, he's already told us that no man is built, born, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, or the decision, but by the will of God. And Rome, but you got to receive it, brother. And I get it. You have to receive it. But it's more of an awakening, not going from an out column to an in column. It's awakening to what's already true. See, the gospel in, in Hebrew says that the gospel is like a treasure. And how many know treasure doesn't become real when you find it? It's always been there, true, objectively true. It may be true in you, but the problem is it's not true to you, so you don't manifest that. So you see that the, the treasure is already inside of you, and the treasure doesn't become real when you, when you add faith to it. Same way as if your daughter came up to you and said, hey, God, hey, Dad, I want you to be my dad now your daughter doesn't need your permission for you to become a father she wasn't born by her will she was born by your will and she's you're always her father she may not like it she may run away she may not love the love in the house she may hate that idea but it doesn't make her less of a daughter like it doesn't make you a father when she agrees with it does that make sense for by one man's offense death reigned in life how much more who received you got to receive it brother but remember the message is awakened it's a passive receiving. This word lambano is actually used when Paul says, I received 39 stripes. Did Paul agree on his decision for 39 stripes to, to be whipped? No, it was a passive receiving. It was already true. And passively, he was awakening to that was the reality. He was getting beat up on that thing. So yes, you have to receive it. But it's not a work. It's something you awaken to. Awaken, O sleeper, for the light has come. I'm sorry if I just ruined your day. So when did this new birth take place? And I'll, I'll go through this because this is a part of a bigger conversation that we're about to open up. But what I want to do is make the enormity of the cross so big that it has little room for you. 
Because it's not because of you. It's for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. It wasn't for God hated sin so much and hated humanity, he murdered his son on the cross to show you how much he can tolerate you. So when were we born again? 1 Peter 1 3 says this Blessed be the God and Father of Lord Jesus Christ, according to <coughs> your obedience, your decision. You're mustering up enough faith, your sincerity. No, it says, according to his great mercy, he has called caused us to be born again to a living hope through the <laughs> resurrection of Jesus. You know what that means? That the virgin tomb <coughs> was humanity's womb to get born again. When Jesus went to the cross, died to death, and rose from the dead, you were born again. Nicodemus, there's nothing you can do to get born again. And unless I do all that, you won't even see the kingdom. But I've been trying to get everybody born again. Great. But make sure you're using them to awaken to something rather than making a transactional thing that they go from an outline to an inline. There's no more out. Everybody's in. You're reconciled, so live reconciled. Does that make sense? It's objectively true that you were forgiven in Christ. It's objectively true that you were born again, not in your decision, but in the resurrection of Christ. But the true born-again experience allows you to participate in this as a gift and actually live it out. You see, because this is true in you, but it, not, it might not be true to you yet. It's true of you that you're born again, but my, a lot of the areas of my life don't look like I'm born again. But it's okay when you know the truth about what's objective, you get set free to enjoy the subjective reality. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. The reason why I say this is because it's about dead religion. And you point to someone and saying you must be born again is religious. Because what you're telling them is that there's something that you can do outside of Christ's death and resurrection that can get you there. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he's Lord, you will be saved. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. This is the good news. While you were still yet a sinner, weren't even a Christian, didn't love Jesus 2,000 years ago without your permission, without your faith, as Adam, without your faith, made you a sinner, Jesus went to the cross, lived the life you should have, died the death you should have, rose with you, ascended, seated you in heavenly places without your permission. It's finished. Nothing I'm saying is becoming true based on your commitment to Jesus because then you're going to continue to live by your commitment to Jesus. My friends, the gospel is not that you can... The gospel is not that you can receive Jesus into your heart. The good news is that he's already received you into his. Without your performance, without your obedience, without your yes. Well, then that violates free will, right? It violates our humanistic view of free will. But God did that because he knows outside of his embrace, outside of his performance, there is no freedom. It's a life of burden. And you can make choices to enjoy that. But true freedom isn't having the right not to choose God. True freedom is that when you're wrapped in his love, you understand that anything outside of that is not freedom at all. Imagine one of these little girls in the alley She's playing with like the flag and a Mack truck is coming. And it's blowing the horn and it can't stop. Imagine your daughter's there. 
and you run. And you tackle your daughter and get her out of the way. She's not going to say, hey, get off me, man. You invaded my personal space. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself without your permission. Not counting your sin against you. That's the good news. And when you hear that, the abundance of the heart wakes up and your mouth confesses like, holy crap, that's awesome. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But what we're concerned about in church is just getting people's confession and the heart thing never hits. And it's not out of my confession I can build the faith to believe it. It's like when you give people good news, like, oh my God, it's real. Jesus is awesome. You don't have to be born again. And if you think you do, congratulations, you're ready to work. It's good news because it happened without your permission. He came and got you out of the way of the Mack truck without your permission because he loves you. And it's news. Why? Because it already happened. It's past tense. When you watch the news, they're telling you things that already happened. And when you tell people that, that they don't have to do X, Y, Z to get in, and that God's already abundantly loving them and forgiving them and has accepted them in the beloved, it charges something in the heart and takes the weight off of performance to now say, wow, that's refreshing. I want that. There is no freedom outside the will of God. You may be, you can be free to choose it, but you playing in the middle of an alley with your little toy and while the traffic's coming all day is not freedom at all. You can choose it, but it's not freedom. Real freedom is your father's embrace, reconciling you out of the danger and loving. You understand that? That's the best I got for you. Ben, can I just get you on guitar real quick and let's get out of here? Yeah. We're getting hungry. Okay, cool. Um, if I freaked you out, don't worry. There's a lot more to come. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I have no problem getting up here saying this because, you know, the same people who wrote about this, Paul, John, were the biggest evangelists. And I promise you one thing it does do. When you start getting the heart full for this and understand that it is good news because it's already happened, you'll start preaching the gospel not to get people out of hell or out of heaven. You'll start preaching it because you cannot stand the fact that they are living apart from their design that God has come to bring in Jesus Christ. You'll be overwhelmed with compassion to preach the gospel and not be dutiful to get people's decision. Because I'm telling you, I made that decision seven years ago. And it was always about my decision and my commitment and what I bring to the table. And it's like I made a secret handshake around the blood of Jesus and said, God, I'll just do it my way. Let's do business with God today, guys. Man, he loves you so much. And if Adam's sin brought guilt, shame, and condemnation, how much more with a free gift of righteousness will he you awaken to so you can reign in life on this chapter 5? Don't get mad at me. Get mad at Paul. Paul wasn't apathetic because he knew this happened without his permission. It awakened him. He says, I was compelled by love. Just don't make God smaller. We can fight theologically about this if you want, but I'm just like, my days of preaching the gospel just to get. Let me ask you this. If it wasn't for the threat of hell or the promise of heaven, would you still want Jesus now? If it wasn't for the fear of going to hell or the promise of going to heaven, would you want him here? Well, I'll tell you what. Give people the good news. And when it's unlocked in their heart, it's going to save them from the hell they're in now so they don't have to worry about the one they're going to. The good news is not a proposition that could be true if you just said yes. The good news is the announcement that all are freely justified by his grace. When people hear that in their sin, that there's a forgiver, not because of what they can confess, but simply because there's a forgiver, they want to know him because it takes no merit on their own. They don't got to bring their shame, their performance, their guilt, their condemnation, but they need forgiveness that was there before they sinned. And they 
embrace that. And they don't want to sin anymore. You were made for hyper grace. It's the only kind God's interested in. A grace that seeks out the lost and doesn't ask for apology. And yes, you can apologize. But just like the, the the prodigal son, he comes with this mindset saying, God, I disobeyed you. I should be kicked out of heaven. I'm no longer willing to be called your son. And he's struggling coming back to the church, coming back to the Father's house with this. And he's tormenting him. But at least he's going to get it off of his chest. And he's ready to give his speech. He says, Dad, i got to tell you something. And the dad says, shut up. It's not about your confession. It's my confession. Get him the robe. Get him the ring. Get him the sandals. He's lost his mind. He thinks he's a slave. Clothe him in what I've done. Because guess what? This robe, this ring, it's all inheritance. But you don't get inheritance when you die, son. You get inheritance because I work for it. And I'm giving it to you as a gift. And I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it, Father. I know, but when you see the ring on you, it's going to remind you of who you were, and you're not going to want to be walking filth anymore. You're not going to want to go to a distant land, because when you come to yourself, you're saying, it's a lot better in my father's house. This is what I'm going to about the gospel. Everything else I read in the Bible has to fit that context. Otherwise, I gotta, I gotta do more learning. This is how the lost get found without shame in their life. This is how the lost come to church and don't feel guilty when they miss. This is how I am okay with you staying home and cooking breakfast and joining your wife and just feeding each other strawberries and missing church. Um, that's why I'm not threatened about it. But more importantly, that's not why I need you. I don't 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 need you. But I want you. I'm not moved by me. I'm moved by love. You know, when I die, the only thing I want people to remember about me, I want an atheist to be like, man, God really loved that dude. I don't want to be known for the churches. I don't want to be known for the sermons. I don't want to be known for him. I want to be known for... <laughs> Uh, the God I don't believe in really love that God. So just stand up. Oh, I know I went a little bit late, but I got to do this real quick too. I'm just shooting from the hip today, but man, this is why I live every day. I just want to remind you that Ephesians 1, anybody like the book of Ephesians? Shh. Hmm? I just want to remind you that it doesn't really make a big deal about you and your decision. But rather it says this. You ready for this, Ben? I'm not. Blessed be the God. Yay, God. And the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has, past tense, blessed you with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose you in him before the fall of man. That we, by his doing, should be holy without blame before him in love. The good news, this was his idea. Having predestined, he thought about this before. He made a way to consider you adopted as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. According to the good pleasure of his will. To the praise of the glory of of his grace by which he made you accepted in the beloved. 
in him. We have redemption through his blood. Not when you say yes. It happened 2,000 years ago. For the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace, which he made abound towards you. It's putting you down. In all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, his dream, according to his good pleasure. All I hear is he, his, by him, his, he, he did this. Before there was a problem, he had a solution. That in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he, by your decision, by your obedience, not your devotion, not your discipline, not your will to be born again. You don't even have the will to be born again. You're born by his will, and he chose you when you were still yet a sinner. Gosh. That the dispensation, the fullness of times that he might gather in all, in all, gather all in Christ. Only if they agree, brother. Only if they say yes. That he might gather together in one all things, all things in Christ. Which he purposed in himself. Both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him, we have also obtained this amazing inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of his will. That we in Christ should be the praise to his glory. In him, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. But faith comes by hearing, it comes by hearing something that's already happened. I'll let you guys read the rest of it. But I will tell you it's all full of he, him, his. That's the only pronoun he's interested in right there. Nothing I just read had anything to do with your applause or your opinion. But I tell you what, when you understand this, while you were still yet a sinner, your agreement just be his agreement gets imparted to you. So I'm here to tell you today that that we are due and people deserve a gospel that drives out dead religion not demands it we are due a gospel that drives out your work to do anything and not a gospel that depends on your works Paul says one thing I'm just going to this have we not used God's grace in vain? Thank you, God. I thank you for your day, God. I thank you for the passion of your love, the all-consuming fire, God. I thank you, Lord, that your love even burns off all the identity that we, our pseudo-identity that came from the Father of Man. I thank you, God, that before we could even have the chance to say yes, that you chose us in him before the foundation of the world. I thank God that my born again date wasn't on January 7, 2016, because I hit this denomination. I think my born again date is when Jesus rose from the grave. Oh, gosh. I thank you, Lord, that it's not about me asking you into my heart, because you, you can see some all things, you're everywhere. But it's that you, when I wasn't looking, living in sin, you included me into your sin. So I thank you, Lord, for the praise and quote of his name. I will never stop making a big deal about what you've done, even if it minimizes all the things I was told religiously I had to do. So I thank you, God, that it's something beautiful to awaken to, and that awakeness, that grace that I awaken to empowers me to live in my original design in Christ's righteous in Jesus' name. So we bless you. Thank you guys for sticking around tonight. I know it was little, but it's all right. That's what we signed up for. So we love you guys. Hey, Annie's going to be here next week preaching. Everybody show up. Let's holler her down. Let's give accordingly, man. It's going to be a good month. We got some surprises coming up in the near future. Um, if you want to talk to me and chat with me, it's fine. Um, 
Yeah, that's what I want to say. Love you guys. Give it up for Ben. <laughs> But most of all, give it up for Jesus.